So let's start with a light question. Do humans actually have free will or are we just a giant LLM neural net train with quadrillions of parameters and a brain that evaluates that equation super fast? Mitch, after you answer this, will you tell us the meaning of life too, please? <laughs> I'm going to hold that one. That'll be pod number two when we, you know. That's the sequel. The second coming of Mitch. That is perfect. No, it, it's a super interesting question. I've surfaced that internally in our channels. We're talking about generative AI all the time. Thinking about what are these things actually doing? For the LLMs, like it, it really is just next token prediction. They're just predicting the next word. But it turns out if you're sophisticated enough at doing that, really, really interesting things come out. And I posited that you can't tell me that we're not doing something totally similar. Every argument back to me was like, you know, there's no like internal representation of states. And I was like, you don't have that either, right? You have a bunch of columnar computing cells stitched together in this infrastructure in your brain, right? Nothing about it is abstract in any way. And the way we think about concepts, it's just, we have this internal representation, which we think is very special, but it's all hallucinated effectively. Yeah. It's a big shared hallucination. That's what we call reality. The fact that you can predict human behavior statistically, right, at a large population level, it just tells you, like, I do not think we actually have free will because it is predictive. Maybe not for an individual, but for the population. I don't even know what it would mean to say we have free will. What does that mean? At any moment, you could do anything? Well, yeah, that's true, right? But the thing you choose to do, you couldn't have then gone back and chose to do something else. Even to say, like, do we have free will? It's kind of a, it's a non-question, right? Because there, there's no way you could do something other than what you're about to do next. The point is that what you're about to do next is actually just a function of the chemicals in your body and an internal state of what I'm at right now. That is going to determine what I'm about to do next. But that has int very interesting implications for like morality, what we think about what happens to us and what we do. If you end up doing something that, that doesn't work out great or is even viewed from societal perspective as, you know, immoral, the reaction to that shouldn't be, well, we need to teach them a lesson or something. The reaction to that is really, well, there's something wrong with the circumstances or the processing. It's not like they made a bad choice, like moralizing about it isn't necessarily going to change the pattern from from like a personal perspective when you think in these terms it's actually like a nice framing for making mistakes you make a mistake and it's like well should i blame myself and you know worry so badly that i, I should have done something else no but if i take that to be formative change my own pattern for the next iteration i can do something better it's it, it's a useful question I, I just don't think the free will side i don't know what it would mean to, to say that we have it it's interesting mitch like you could almost argue that our brains are machines machines that just have to be constantly doing something because i don't know if you've ever tried to like sit down and meditate and how hard that is especially when you try to do it after you haven't done it in a long time to sit there and be silent it almost is like it takes an active or conscious decision to sit there and think about and do nothing and observe and that to me is kind of weird when you think about us being prediction machines is there something in us that's just constantly going has to be chewing on something and so it just grabs shit, random shit, and it just is chewing through it. I used to have this experience when I was coding all the time where I'd run into a problem and I couldn't figure it out. And the best way to figure it out was to take a break and not think about the problem, not talk about it with anyone else, just let it sit there in my brain. And nine times out of 10, the next day I come back in with the solution ready for me. Like who did that? Usually when it would happen to me, either I came up with a solution in the shower, that was the most common one, or sometimes I awoke with the answer. In the middle of the night, I just woke up with the answer to the question and I would have to go immediately sit and program and and get it out. There's a lot of interesting stuff I've been just recently getting into about how the brain is actually working. Like they're modeling basically the feed forward networks versus the feedback networks, right? And there's more feedback from the top down going back to your, you know, the areas of your brain closer to your sense organs. There's like 10 times as many directional networks going that way than going back up from the sense organs to the neocortex. Weird thing about that. Many people would think it was the other way around. But the idea is that what you're neocortex is doing is actually building a model of the world and sending that model back down to your sense organs and then correcting for an error term. You can imagine if you're sitting there meditating with zero stimulus, maybe part of the weirdness of that is you don't have any error term to check against. So your brain is just searching for something. Yeah. That's like being in a, one of those tanks, a sensory deprivation tank or something, right? The brain just kind of freaks out because it doesn't know what to do. Mitch, I'm not, I don't think I fully grasp what you said. Does that mean that there's 10 times the amount of bandwidth from my eyes to my brain than from my brain to my eyes. Am I thinking about that right? So there's 10 times as much bandwidth from my brain to my eyes to send information to my eyes. I guess to your eyes is not necessarily the right framing, but from your neocortex 
to the more the areas of your brain closer to your sense organs 10 times the data flowing top down versus bottom up yeah that is the opposite of what i would have thought even with just with your eyes like the reason i go to my eyes is because you know everything's so visual like there's just constant information coming at you well i think generative you know generative ai when you think about what it's doing when you start from just a blob image and you start constructing using deep neural networks an image around that to match some target image right you're really doing error correction at every point along the way i think some of this stuff is you basically have to say no you're having to say no a lot and then yes once for each pixel for example is that that basic idea yeah yeah there's a, there's a lot of math between that but but basically right you're you're always looking for the error term versus what you're expecting yeah you really knocked it out of the park chad but chad that was a great question to start us off with now we're completely on a we're going down a different path than i thought we were going to i started drinking my scotch a lot faster when you asked that question by the way <laughs>